So you get these chips that are a real hazard. They're extremely a hazard when they get into the chuck. That's one of the reasons you don't, a lot of times, especially if there are chips, you don't stand right next to your chuck while you're running the machine. They can catch in there, come out, and get you. Um, we'll run a little bit more of this. It took me a little bit today, actually. For whatever reason, I couldn't hardly get nasty chips to form. And I've got ones many times that are a lot nastier. And as these say right here, stop the machine before pulling the chips, and you decide. Okay, that's what I thought might happen. It broke the end of the tool a little bit. Because I did stop it in cut. Okay, now we're getting some nasty chips. There. Those can come in and be real dangerous. And... Oops, wrong lever. So, you want to avoid that. You want to not be in the way of the chuck if they uh, happen to get in there, they get caught up, it can be bad. They're that is a lot worse when those come around in the chuck. You'll get a ball sometimes that's just large. One of the things you want to do is stop. Stop what you're doing if you can. Clean all that stuff out. Uh, other times you're at the end of something, you let it run, you stay back away from where that ball could come out. Most of the time the ball will eventually cut off from things. Part of it will stay on, some of it will jump out. Uh, but the big worry and concern, it can kill you right off one time because the ball can get on here strong enough so that when it grabs you it will grab you in or come by right chips you know take a couple fingers with it or something because uh, those chips are actually strong enough um, had in way back years ago had a friend that got cut right it cut into his bone a little bit just in no time and I've had several of them myself that uh, you go to grab it and you think everything's clean, the machine's off, and you're surprised, especially when they're still hot. And they will come in and just cut you a quarter, three-eighths of an inch deep. You might not make it to the bone, but you, it reminds you, don't do this. Um, the, I kind of wiped out that tool. I didn't want to. I wiped it out actually before the video started, as it turns out, making those nice chips and then stopping it in cut. I knew I shouldn't have, but it was cutting so pretty. I was just hoping that that one out of ten times where it won't break and it will continue on and just cut the same thing, I could just turn it on and have it. It wasn't going to happen. I'm going to grab another tool. Now, why am I not using inserted tools like I normally would or anything? Well, they're kind of a cheat. Uh, they will have chip breakers built into them. I just wanted to start with the most basic possible. And I didn't want to go wasting new tools. And I didn't feel like grinding that one again. But we are at least grabbing another good used tool. And actually, the uh, insert tools are actually cheaper most of the time for me because I buy them surplus. So let's see if we get a little bit more of that cut going again. I got to drop my height a little bit because this went to a bigger bit. Okay, there, making some somewhat nasty chips. 
I'm going to stop it, let it cut itself off this time so I don't break up the bit. Okay, that, that is a combination of things. Your speed and feed is the biggest one that do, does it. You may not be able to change your RPM. Um, generally, dropping RPM down will make them break off better. But sometimes uh, RPM up. Feed rate. Feed rate is a key one. Now, I'm running about four thousandths per revolution there. I'm going to kick it up to around 10, and it may very well just start breaking off chips. But if it doesn't, we'll do something else. Okay, it's making a little more manageable curl, but not yet breaking off. So, let's try... Uh, I'm going to try reducing depth. That will be the next one. I'll go for this. Now, where this really becomes important, trying to get... There, now we're getting some little... Uh, that's cheap breaking. That's breaking because it's inconsistent surface there. Yeah, it's binding up more. Okay. So I turned the feed rate way up. It's still not quite breaking the way I want to. And I know many of you are out there saying, put a chip breaker in it. Putting a chip breaker in it um, helps a lot. And we'll talk about chip breakers in a little bit, but I want to talk about how you can play with some of this before you put a chip breaker in it. So, let's try. Normally it is slower, but it just seems like it would want faster today for some reason. Let's, let's go slower. Eh, that's way slower, okay. Still at 20 thousandths per revolution. Don't really want to push it more than that. Still not, just may not get a good, good uh, break on it. That's way too slow to do anything practical. Okay, so let's try going faster. That worked, but this particular bit won't like it. That bit won't live long at that faster speed. Okay, you can play with this. You can come up with something that really works good. Uh, if you're doing a CNC, you kind of have to do this a lot of times. That's one of the drawbacks to a CNC is you got to get the chips broken or controlled. Now, another way that you can control this I'm doing something to get the surface finish I want. Sometimes you just have stringy chips, and even in a CNC you will. So what you'll do is you'll program, or manually, you'll be cutting a little bit, and you stop it. You stop it. Let it run. Stop it. It's real easy to do on a CNC, because you could just stop it, and you don't even notice it just enough to where it's a different chip. So you're making little chips that may be six inches long. You cut it off. You start again. And it makes these little chips instead of having a big stringer that's a problem. In a CNC, it can really tear up the machine sometimes. Some of the sensors and different things that are inside the cabinet, while they're relatively strong, they're not as strong as what's around a manual lathe. And you can just, just make a big mess out of them. Um, chip breaker. What is a chip breaker? A chip breaker. I'm going to go ahead and put one in this. I don't put them in my tools most of the time. 
a chip breaker is just a little valley that's below the cutting edge so that the cutting surface can come off and roll down and have something to crash against to help it uh, break better. It breaks because it's bending. If it is, which is part of where slow speed normally works better, high speed makes the chip hotter. If the chip gets hot, it's really flexible, it's hard to get it to break. Shallower depth, you're not making as much heat as with a deeper cut. And different steels and things, get on some 1100 series um, stainless or some, I mean not stainless, aluminum. That's pure aluminum, that sucks. That absolutely sucks. You, you, your chips are just, I thought about, I've got a piece of it over here, but it wouldn't really explain the normal steel that we're working with most of the time. I mean, I could have brought it out and we'd make this big snarl, but it, it would, would have all been aluminum and you wouldn't get it to break. It's just, it's terrible. Uh, your 300 series uh, stainlesses, I forget which one is supposed to break up better. There's a machinability index for all kinds of different metals. And I don't normally look at it, but I know that uh, sometimes it will, it will make a difference if you're planning a project where you can choose. I usually have to choose the material for other reasons and I'm not looking at it. I just go, oh shoot, yeah, it's gonna be 304 stainless. I'm not gonna like that. Um, I think 302 is the machinable one. A little more expensive, similar otherwise, but I forget for sure. I, I'm not looking at that every day, and generally I don't have the option. It's generally either 304 because it's available, it's inexpensive, or it's 316 because they need the corrosion, or we're in a 400 series because we need the strength. So we're going to grind a uh, chip breaker into this. If the camera was having a hard time seeing that or not, but I was. I need more light back here. Some people could tell that I, <clears throat> I am more of an office fixture than what I used to be. I've done this stuff for a long time. I can do it, but uh, I'm somewhat of an awesome. Okay, now let's get back. Let's look at this first. Okay, we've got the divot in there, so it'll come down, and that also gives you a positive rake to start with, so it cuts with a little less pressure. And it'll roll and it should help it break up a little better. I don't like doing that most of the time on these form tools. I will buy, and we use, uh, that's a worn one, but a lot of times ones with chip breakers molded in them from the factory, a little one on the various carbide inserts. This one's all torn up, but you can see there's a chip breaker, a little red ledge there for it to hit. And they have that figured out that for whatever steel and stuff it was planned for, that this would be perfect with this fancy little shape. And um, if they were made just for your manufacturing process, sometimes they are, but it works or it doesn't. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a deficit most of the time. It does take away a little bit of the edge strength yet because you're coming out, but it gives you a little bit more positive entrance. You can also see uh, we'll get to that. Let's, let's go ahead and cut with this a little bit first. We're going to go look at some other inserts because some of them, a chip breaker's not the same from one to another. And I'm going to back this off because that tool is not as strong. I'm going to back off and not try and kill it with speed or with feed. I'm going to go back to the ten thousandths per revolution and see with the chip breaker that we can get it to break in there. Because I really don't want to just wipe the tool out. It's not perfect, but it's breaking it up some. Definitely more than it. We'll start a new cut here in a little bit. More than it was doing before with this. Uh, reasonable speed and feed still getting getting springs off of there and actually let's just go ahead and swap
this amount of head on there. Hmm. That needs to be indexed. An ideal break, it should be making little uh, little curly cues or little pieces like that. Still, that's not a real energy efficient break it's making there, but it's pretty controllable as far as taking care of the chips anyway. That one's a little too tight of a curl. Let's see, we'll start over another cut. Now you can see how we're not breaking so much where we're at a shallow cut here. Still not making it big long strings like we had at first. But uh, when we get in a little bit more depth it should start breaking them up again. And some days when you're in job shop you just don't have the choices. Generally, you try and, and set it so you get a really good cut, stuff like this, when you're ripping down a lot of material, when you're changing size quickly. But if you're uh, especially coming to finish, working on a repair or something, you don't have that luxury of being able to play with it and uh, get that nice cut. So then you've got to watch out for these long stringers. and. Uh, the best is if you can get them to break. If not, deal with it. Uh, one of the things, like I say, you're, you're cutting along here, you get a string, and you see that it's binding around the chuck, uh, disengage your feet. Let it run a couple revolutions, cut again. And that, that way you'll have smaller pieces that won't be hanging together so much. Uh, if it really gets dangerous, quit, cut the stuff. Sometimes you gotta cut them with diagonal cutters. They, they, uh, most of these look fairly breaky today, but a lot of times you need a good pair of diagonal cutters to get your chips cut. Now, let's go back and look at some of our different chip breakers and some of our inserts here. And there's also normal... Um, these are the ones we just brought out. Some without chip breakers. These ones are rather unique. They're single, single direction. These will only cut on the one direction if you look, look at them. And why would I buy those? Well, they were cheap. I think I probably paid 10 cents a piece for those inserts. I like to buy surplus when it makes sense. And then there's ones um without you know without a chip breaker and these ones oh these have a chip breaker too that's a different one i forgot those two yeah that's a big radius with a chip breaker in it and you could see this chip breaker this is kind of what i was talking about see how it starts right at the edge and has an angle coming down in to where it breaks where these other ones let's pull one out of the package hopefully you can see there's a little bit of a flat right on the top and then they make the chip breaker in there. And so that doesn't cut quite the same as one that comes up to a, a sharp edge. It's just a barely a flat along there. You can see it more at the point of it, how it's got a little point, little flat there, more so than at the rest of it. There's a smaller one, but this has got a bigger flat, um, bigger flat before it takes off into the chip breaker. It's hard to see, so I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but there's different shapes of them. Some of them have got uh, just plain bumps on them. Now, those are all were negative rake. Yeah, that center is just a few thousandths above the outside edge. So even if it decided to follow on a straight bend across that, this would help it pull up a little bit more because the center raised section is higher than the actual edge. So, chips. They are a problem. It's a general thing from the start. And a CNC, you know, a lot of times you're using a chip conveyor or something, and uh, you need them to be broken up in little pieces. I don't do much with CNCs here. We do have some.